Welcome back to America's Commercial Real Estate Show. I'm Michael Bull. This segment is brought to you by CommercialAgentSuccess.com. If you're a broker or an agent, you'll want to check it out. Well, today we're talking about Integra Realty Resources Viewpoint 2018. We have Anthony Graziano. He's the chairman of Integra Realty Resources here in Studio One. And Anthony, there's a lot happening with interest rates, with the Tax Act, um, and where is how is that going to impact retail? I think everybody's concerned about retail. You're reading the paper that retail's doing terribly, uh, but, but, but I look around in our market, people want to buy retail properties. Uh, the properties seem to be doing well, especially in the gray areas. So what is your, what's your outlook for retail? You know, it's inter I think the retail market is very interesting. It is certainly not uniform, but, but there are some big trends that I think we should identify and talk about. The first, I think, is very interesting. We cover it in here maybe not explicitly, but you can certainly see it in the numbers, is this. It used to be that community scale retail with a shopping center and the inlines would trade at a 50 to 100 basis point discount against, uh, you know, lower than the neighborhood community retail, right? So you take a neighborhood store with the convenience services. What we're seeing now is a convergence, right? Those grocery anchored shopping centers are not getting the same premium, price premium that they were uh, because the tenant mix is not as strong and the future of grocery is changing. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're seeing is that the neighborhood centers are actually holding up really well. That's number one. Unanchored. Unanchored right. neighborhood centers holding up well. It's, it's difficult, more difficult to fill those 30,000, 40,000 foot boxes. Right. Um, big store closings, what we're seeing, the other trend that we're seeing obviously is that the value retailers are really the darlings, right? The TJX, uh, all of the, the Kohl's, the TJ Maxx, uh, Marshalls, those type of value retailers now mm -hmm. have really become the credit anchors. Uh, and that's really where our, the business is, is changing a bit uh, in terms of retail tenant mix is to find the right mix that brings the repeat customer to the shopping center. Yeah. Um, that always used to be a department store or other type of junior anchor, but the, the value retailers are really dominating. If you look at the growth in retail, what you're seeing is a, the dollar stores, the five belows, all of those type of value retailers are driving all of the new growth in retail, other than the luxury segment. We'll talk about that a little bit. Obviously, the regional malls have been undergoing, certainly over the last 10 years, big transformations. We've seen a big bifurcation of what we call the C and D malls, those malls that were anchored by the Sears and the JC Penneys and so forth. Um, but the big department stores are really the story there, right? The loss of credit, the loss of the change in the business model of the big department stores is really what's forced those C and D malls into repositioning mode. Mm -hmm. um, long run though, I like retail. I'm going to tell you that I think there's three or four things about retail assets that are very strong indicators of why investors should be looking to retail, particularly even this year and next year, mm -hmm. uh, even if there are some negative cross currents in the economy. Number one, retail tends to be single story. So in suburban markets, you have very well parked, uh, reasonably priced assets that are easy to retenant because you've got good parking and you've got great location, visibility, signage. In urban markets, the retail land values tend to be very strong. So the underlying land sometimes is available for reuse. So you're buying retail really as a holding strategy, an interim holding strategy. Um, third, I think the, the bigger trend here, everybody really over talks about e-commerce. I think mm -hmm. certainly the growth in e-commerce is remarkable. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things happening in e-commerce that are fundamentally changing the way in which we buy. Yeah. Um, it's changing the economics of retail. But the, the, aside from the e-commerce growth, there's always going to be the need. People want to get out of the house. They want to right. go to the market. They want to interact. And what we see is that the really successful retail investors are doing two things. They're investing in tenants that have some type of an entertainment concept. Mm -hmm. I went to Whole Foods the other night in Miami. They just built a new Whole Foods down, down the street from me. They have a bar of and course. a restaurant in the Whole Foods. Wow. So you, you are going to the grocery store and you say to your wife, you know, let's go have dinner first. Yeah. And then let's go grocery shopping. This well, I'll tell my wife now, I'll go shopping. I'll go right. shop now if there's well, she a bar. Has, she told me, she says, you're going to go have a beer and I'll go shopping. There you go. Um, but you know, the, the, the investors that are looking at tenants that are investing in entertainment are being, are being successful. The other thing is 
you have to manage the real estate right. You have to understand what your tenants, how your tenants are making money, what their margins are, and stop pressing the tenants up against the highest market rent in the market. Let your tenants succeed. Yeah. Keep your occupancy stable. I think what we're going to see is a, a return to more fundamental management practices mm -hmm. to keep your retail strong. And I think when you do that, you stay a little under market on your market rents, you manage to make sure that your retail tenants are making money, uh, you're going to have a successful retail operation. Yeah. So you have to buy with the understanding that you're not going to just continue to raise up rents, but you're going to have a stable long-term operating asset. Yeah. And I think that's really where the investors are going today with retail. They're, yeah. they're driving entertainment, they're driving traffic, and they're managing the retail so that the, the tenants are making money. Yeah, well, I like that. And I like your point that retail is typically good real estate. You know, it's, it's, it's good locations, it's, right. it's flat. I, I like all the things you say there. And I think that's why I, we see a lot of interest from, from buyers in retail, no matter what the kind of occupancy you have at the property right now. Yeah. What do you, how do you feel, Anthony, about the Amazon, you know, buying Whole Foods and, and some of these online uh, purchases, you know, wanting this last mile delivery, you think that's gonna continue to help bricks and mortar uh, side of retail? Well, I think it's a recognition of, of the reality that I just spoke of, right? Mm -hmm. People want to get out of the house. They want some place to go. And I think that the, the concept that everything's going to be online is an impossible. You'll never get to that last mile. So I think the e-commerce operators actually heading into the bricks and mortar is really their strategy to get yeah. into that chain of, of demand, right? Yeah. So they realize that they are going to run out of room to be able to take the low hanging fruit. There's certain goods, you know, furniture, big durables, things like that, that they just can't touch. Um, groceries are a really difficult thing logistically mm -hmm. to deliver on demand. I think we're gonna get better at it, mm -hmm. but uh, it's gonna require big logistical changes. So I think the, the migration of those, com those companies will continue and they will become big real estate players. The question really is, can, can they manage the, the balance of the retail portfolio, right? Yeah. You have to manage your inlines, you have to manage your tenant mix. It's, it's becoming the tenant is one element. Um, and so if they develop this, a, a, a product that, that delivers everything I'm saying, entertainment and otherwise, mm -hmm. I think they're going to be as successful in the market as the tenants today. Well, let me ask you about tenant mix because you guys are doing appraisals all over the country. Yep. How do you look at the number of restaurants that are in a lot of these retail properties? I mean, there's a lot of uh, restaurants that are open. It seems like a lot of our clients uh, in the retail properties, that they want restaurants. But if you're doing a, appraisals and are you looking at, all right, well, there's two restaurants in this center. Are you looking at how many restaurants are in the area and, and what, what could happen there? Sure. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's interesting you talk about that. We, we see that a lot in the urban markets mm -hmm. because the rents are high and the only way to afford those rents uh, is to run a successful restaurant. And serve liquor. That's right. <laughs> and the problem is, though, is that restaurants, as cr the credit quality of restaurants, you know, tends to vary. Yeah. So there's a difference, obviously, between restaurants and casual dining, you know, national chain casual dining, mm -hmm. um, but that is becoming an increasing percentage overall, I think, of the, of the retail mix because mm -hmm. there are fewer traditional retailers of apparel and, and other goods. So uh, part of it is a fill the center strategy, right? Yeah. How do I fill the center? I put restaurants in there, but it does affect the durability of the center, but it, it also gives them the opportunity to keep rents high. But this gets back, I think, to what I'm talking about in terms of being under, understanding the value chain. Mm -hmm. uh, if you fill your center with restaurants, uh, I think you're exposed. There's enough competition then. It attracts people to come to your center on a regular basis. That's the positive. But it also chews up parking. And it also doesn't provide an array of services. So it becomes how much dining can people do? And when there's a pullback in the economy, mm -hmm. one of the first things people stop doing is going out to dinner three times a week. So when the economy is doing well, a, rest, a, a fully tenanted, center with restaurants will tend to do pretty well and you'll be able to get maximal market rent but you're going to suffer the downside of vacancy as the economy wavers or as your local economy changes tastes so yeah. it's pluses and minuses right well anything new and your viewpoint 2018 for industrial it seems like if online sales keep keep growing industrials is going to continue to be the darling sector sure uh, I, I think if you look at the transaction volumes you know office <clears throat> multifamily uh, and the other, the other asset classes besides industrial, what you'll see is mm -hmm. our forecast is that of all the asset classes, industrial is going to do the strongest, mm -hmm. be the strongest in 2018. Um, that is obviously a cautionary tale because what that means is everybody's going to pile into 
industrial investment, mm -hmm. uh, which could drive capitalization rates down. Of all the asset classes in 2018, that's the one that has the greatest potential for uh, cap continued cap rate compression. Um, we're building a lot of industrial, and it tends to be quicker to build, quicker to market, uh, which means we tend to overbuild that in certain markets. And so you have to be cautious. Uh, most of the markets that we cover here are in what we call the you know, late expansion phase in industrial. Denver has tipped into what we call hypersupply, where we've got uh, more construction, net absorption, decreases in rents. But fundamentally, the changes in logistics are, what dri are what's driving the industrial market right now. We're seeing a lot more industrial construction that's large, yeah. uh, high distribution, you know, high ceilings, very well located next to highways. Uh, and it's the users of that, of that type of industrial cannot go into the existing product. So even though you may have a 5 or 6%, 8% structural industrial vacancy in your marketplace, uh, when IKEA comes to town, it needs a half a million square feet in yeah. one single location that vacancy rate really doesn't matter. They're going to build a new facility. Right. Uh, and so that, that's what we're seeing. What we're seeing is the big retailers now are repositioning their uh, chain, mm -hmm. you know, their logistics chain. And so a lot of this construction is really the shifts in logistics that are occurring. And we're also seeing, you know, obviously the port cities are, mm -hmm. are seeing a lot of uh, construction currently. Yeah. Um, but we expect that that will slow going into 19, but we're going to have a pretty strong 18 in the industrial sector. Yeah, well, I think all the industrial owners are, are doing the Snoopy dance and uh, <laughs> uh, they're enjoying this. And, and interesting, you talk about that, that huge demand for investors for industrial. We're about to bring a $30 million project on the market. And, and I think it'll be a, a cap rate of probably around six. Um, and I, I'm interested to see the demand because the tenant has the rights to early cancellation. Right. So, you know, this $30 million property could be vacant, but I think because of the demand and because it's a strong tenant, and, and I don't think people are going to think they're going to cancel, but there's that right to cancel. I think it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens there. Well, I want to ask you about the office market and what do you expect to happen in the office market moving forward. So stay with us. I'm Michael Bull. This is America's Commercial Real Estate Show. We will be right back. 